Welcome, Campus Heroes. My name is John Mad Dog Hall, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of a company called Optimal Dynamics. I'm also the Board Chairman of the Linux Professional Institute, and I am the President of Project Kawan. You'll learn more about these as we go along. For those of you who do not know me, I have been in the computer industry since 1969. I have been programming longer than most of your fathers have been alive, with some possible exceptions. <laughs> I have been working on a wide variety of different systems, some of them very small and some of them very large. I have been a vendor and a customer of computer systems, which means I've been waiting for that bug fix so I could do my work, and I've been trying to create that bug fix for other people to do their work. But most of all, what I'm most proud of is that I am pragmatic. I do not believe that there have to be winners and losers in this world. I believe that we can all win, and I hope that by the end of this talk, you will see why my belief is such. Currently, I am the president of Linux International. I've been doing that for 22 years, when I first met Linus Torvalds and gave him his alpha processor. I've been the president of Project Kawan for 12 years, and I've talked to Campus Party many times about it. <coughs> Pardon me. I've been the advisor to a program here in Brazil to create single board computers at a much, less, much lower cost than you pay for them today. I've been the board chair of the Professional Institute for the last two years. The Linux Professional Institute certifies people to make sure that the people taking care of your computers <coughs> <coughs> pardon me, know what they're doing. And I've been the CEO of Optimal Dynamics exactly for one day. <coughs> Pardon me. Now, you may have come here hoping that I would tell you which single board computer to buy. And I would love to do that. But the problem is, I can't do that. Because I don't know enough about you and your application to tell you which is the best single board computer to buy. I don't know whether you want your computer just for education, or whether you want your computer for industrial use, or whether you want your computer for military use, where it has to go into tanks and planes and things like that. I don't need whether, don't, whether you need 3D graphics, high performance, because you're a gamer, or whether low performance 3D graphics is good enough. I can't tell you whether you're accessing huge amounts of data and therefore you need huge amounts of RAM memory. I can't tell you that because I don't know. I can't tell, ask you or know what your customer is. Is it an educational customer, just regular consumer, or military? I don't know what your environment is. I don't know what type of voltage you can give your board. Is it five volts? so you can power it off of your cell phone charger, or whether it's 9 to 12 volts, which is the active range for most solar panels, whether it be 24 volts, which is faster charging because you give it more power, more wattage. Wattage is voltage times amperage. Most of your cell phone chargers are one amp. Some are two, but they're all five volts. They're either 5 watts or they're 10 watts, but they're all 5 volts. If you go to 12 volts, you can easily get a 1 amp charger, which has more power than a 5 volt charger. I don't know what type of telecommunication requirements you have. I don't know if you're hooked up to a very high speed internet, which is 100 megabits, 500 megabits a second. What do you can survive with a much lower telecommunications throughput? Maybe you're going to be using cellular, and there are some single board computers that have cellular modems built into them. I don't know what your I.O. requirements are. 
Are you going to be doing high performance graphics? Are you going to be using your single board computer as a tiny server? All of these things are things that you need to look out for. You know, here in Salvador right now, it's your winter time. Hey, I'm here with my little vest on, you know. You guys are in t-shirts, but it's perfect weather. But I know, during your summertime, it gets a lot hotter, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah. And you guys, you have these little wall air conditioners that take the hot air from your room and blows it out into the even hotter air outside. Yeah. But you know, all of you people have space heaters in your rooms, on your desks, underneath your desks, these space heaters. Most of you call them computers, but they're really space heaters. 450 watts of heat. 1,000 watts of heat if you're a gamer, 2,000 watts of heat. You guys treat your computers better than you treat yourselves. You have water cooling on your gaming systems, right? Yeah, I know you guys, yeah. But you know, if you talk about consumer grade electronics, they talk about zero to 40 degrees Celsius. Industrial grade is zero to 70 degrees Celsius. Industrial grade, kind of starts way below zero and goes to some impossible level of heat. Most of the little single board computers are consumer grade. And so after 40 degrees Celsius, you have to put a really nice heat sink on it or a heat sink and a fan, and it still doesn't do any good. You need something which is at least industrial grade here in Salvador. And there's another problem that Salvador has, salt air. How many of you like going to the ocean? I love going to the ocean. You know, the ocean hates computers. The salt in the air eats away the fans, eats away your disk drives, and the salt in the air is just murder on computer systems. This is why I hate fans, really, besides the fact they're noisy. Linus Torvalds hates fans, too. He has no fans in his office. But they are useful, sometimes, in cutting down the heat on your computer. What type of application do you have? Is your application all going to be running on your little single board computer? In that case, you may need more memory you need less communications because your application is all there. But maybe your application is what we call decomposable. In other words, instead of only one core of your CPU running your application, you can break it up so multiple cores of your CPU are all running one application. This means that with the same clock frequency, your application can run much faster because you're spreading that across multiple cores of your CPU. If your application doesn't do that, then having a multi-core CPU doesn't do you much good. It does you even less good on a Windows system. But on Linux and Unix systems, you typically have multiple threads of operation even though you only, your application itself only uses one thread because your window manager uses another thread, your window server uses another thread, your CPU can have another thread, and so forth. But the more decomposable your application is, the more likely that your application will run faster on a multi-core CPU. Maybe you need even more CPU than that's possible, and this is what we call NUMA non-uniform memory. And NUMA can mean that you're actually accessing memory which is outside of your computer. And you divide up your application to do that. You may not know how to do that now, but you will in the future, believe me. And maybe if your application isn't threadable like this, you'll be able to have an application written as a client-server application. 
So how many of you have ever searched for anything using Google or Yahoo? Or, yeah, you know, of course you all have. And of course that search is not being done on your computer. It search is going off someplace to a server system, and that server system is doing the work. That is a client server application. The client is your browser. The server is the thing which is doing the hard work. And maybe that is how you break up your system. Finally, there's something called costs and margins. When you try and produce something in a low volume, the price of it is very high because there's a lot of engineering and development work that has to go into producing that. But once you produce the first one of those, now you want to go into higher and higher volume so you spread the cost of that development across as many systems as possible and you bring down the cost to the end user. I have been in this industry for 47 years and I know that there's only one thing in this industry that really counts and that is volume. There is no other thing. Volume is what you need to strive for. So let's look at these things in closer context. When you go to pick out your CPU, your single board computer, you can think about whether you need a 32-bit or a 64-bit computer. A 32-bit computer will give you more speed if you have a greater number of registers. A 64-bit computer may be faster for some things, but it's going to use up, it's going to generate a whole bunch of heat if you don't need the 64 bits, why are you paying for them? You want to look at the supported address space. In other words, how much address space does it have? Some computers that say they're 64 bit mean they're 64 bit registers and do 64 bit math, but they can't address 64 bits of address. Why is this important? Because with 32 bits, you can address 4 billion bytes of memory at one time. It sounds like a lot. Until you're doing a movie like Lord of the Rings. And then you find out that that 32 bits, those 4 billion bytes, are only one frame of the movie. But now you want to do editing across all those frames. So what you need is 64 bits. How big is that? 64 bits is a billion bytes every second of the day, every day of the year, for the next 5,386 years. Or you're storing 128 bytes for every square millimeter on the surface of the Earth, including all of the oceans. That's a lot of data. You want to make sure that it's capable of supporting virtualization. Why? Because you want to be able to have multiple operating systems operating on your platform at one time. Is it going to be a CISC technology or a RISC technology? CISC is like Intel or AMD. RISC is almost everybody else. It's ARM. It's Motorola. It's PowerPC. It may not make much difference to you until you really start to get into the workings of the machine. How many cores do you have? You could have one core which you're driving very, very quickly. But the problem with that is it generates a lot of heat. And sometimes your chip will not be able to be cooled without a fan. Instead, you have multiple cores each one running at a slower speed, generating less heat. But you can turn them on and off as you need them. Do you need floating point in your application? Most Unix and Linux systems actually have very little floating point. They do most of their work with integers. And not having the floating point lowers the cost of your CPU and also generates less heat. What is the clock rate that you're going to be generating, running your CPU at? 
as all the gamers and overclockers know, the more you turn up that clock speed, the hotter your system gets, right? There's another problem. Your CPU is generated, was designed to run at a certain clock speed. If you turn it up, you could actually have mistakes made in your calculations. And no, it isn't, that doesn't mean your system is going to crash. It may mean that instead of writing the check for $100, you write the check for a million dollars, and you won't know. So be careful out there. How many registers do you have in your CPU? The more registers, typically, the better, because your system can optimize and using that. How many levels of cache do you have? Your CPU is going so fast that your memory looks slow by comparison. The more cache you have between your CPU and your memory, the better you're going to be. How much RAM do you have? This is a big mistake. RAM is so cheap these days, typically give yourself much more RAM than you think you're going to need. And does your system have the capability of doing NUMA, non-uniform memory, or distributed memory model? Does your single board computer have a disk controller on it, or do you do everything through the USB? The USB is a fine bus. But USB 1.2 is 12 megabits a second. How boring. USB 2.0 is 48 megabits a second. Still boring. US 3.0 is 5 gigabits a second. OK, now you're starting to talk. USB 3.1 is 10 gigabits a second. I can live with this, right? But you know, eSATA started off at 3 gigabits a second, it's 6 gigabits a second now, and most of your little disk drives use SATA of some type. If you have a SATA controller on your system, you can offload your USB to doing other things. So take a look and see if you have that. Here are the different speeds of USB, and you also have to make sure that if you're using USB for your disk drive, that you don't put your, uh, your uh, keyboard and your mouse on them, because that will only slow them down. Try and make sure. There's no sense in having a gigabit per second Ethernet controller hooked up to a USB 2.0. This is why the Raspberry Pi doesn't put gigabit per second Ethernet controllers on their board, because everything goes through USB 2.0. If you only have one USB controller, make sure it's both a host and a device so it can travel in both directions. There's other types of processing units. It used to be that a GPU was only for doing graphics. But then we realized that there's lots of problems where you have millions of pieces of data and you want to do the same operation to all of them. And all of a sudden, Bitcoin mining became very useful. So these are the types of things you need to think about. But also, field programmable gate arrays. How many of you know what they are? Field programmable gate arrays. Oh, that's good. That, I think, deserves a penguin. <laughs> oh, yeah, you have to keep alive. You have to keep looking out for those penguins. They come around all the time. Field programmable gate array is a different type of processing unit. It allows you to write, to in fact create your own circuitry to do specialized problems perhaps a hundred times faster than your regular CPU. But more than that, it offloads your CPU to do the normal things a CPU does, like manage the operating system. <sighs> Digital signal processing chips can convert analog signals into uh, analog data into digital data very quickly and vice versa. These are other things you might look out for on your SBC. So these are all the things we've covered so far as the types of things you should have for your criteria for selection of your single board computer. 
You should also think about whether it has the Ethernet connect connectivity you need and the speed you need. But remember that even though a lot of your things you think don't use gigabit per second Ethernet, if you can transfer the data to the wire that fast, it means the wire is given up for all the other machines, signals, and devices that are on that Ethernet. So you may want to have a faster Ethernet controller on there than you would need to transfer your data under normal circumstances because the gigabit per second Ethernet is going to transfer the data 10 times faster than the 100 megabit per second Ethernet, which means you can put 10 times as many devices on there and still get all of your data through. Do you still need a serial port? Maybe so, but you can get a lot of USB to serial adapters, so you don't need a serial port on your USB device. Look at your wireless. BGNN are all 2.4 gigahertz. A is 5.8 gigahertz. 2.4 gigahertz is what most things in your house utilize for doing things, like your microwave uses 2.4 gigahertz to cook food. Many of your radio telephones in your house, not cellular, but you know, radio telephones, cheaper ones, use 2.4 gigahertz. If you have too many things using that frequency, your Wi-Fi is going to suffer, and you probably want to go with 5.8 gigahertz as your main carrier. Bluetooth, is it the latest Bluetooth? Is it Bluetooth uh, low energy? You might want to look at that. Speaking of power, not all power dongles are equal. Make sure that you're supplying enough power to your SBC board because this is one of the main reasons why people get Raspberry Pis and they're unhappy with them. Because they try and use a really cheap phone charger to make the Raspberry Pi go, and they stick a whole bunch of USB devices on there to suck down power, and the power supply cannot provide enough power to keep all of them going. Do not starve your CPU by sticking on lots of USB devices. Instead, get a powered hub that gets its power from a second device to run your disk drives and other high-performance USB devices off of it. SD cards, don't try and be cheap with these either. You need a class 10 or higher for most SBC boards. And a lot of people return their Raspberry Pis because of bad SDC cards. If you have flash on your single board computer, look to see what type of speed it is, because low speed, uh, low speed devices also affect the performance of your, SD, of your system. Remember that Linux systems do a lot of I.O. to the disk. They're very disk intensive. And consequently, if the only thing you're writing to is your flash memory, you're going to need good high speed flash. Look for certifications and availability in your marketplace. Now, this doesn't affect you normally if you ask your uncle or your aunt or your grandfather to go to the United States and bring you back a Raspberry Pi in their suitcase hidden underneath their underwear. You don't care. This is not going to create problems. However, if you want to take that device and make something with it, Maybe it would be best if I just use this thing. Okay. Okay. This is working.
Okay, we're going to go again here. It makes a difference, however, if what you want to do is use your SBC to manufacture something like a new uh, microwave oven or a new refrigerator or a new washing machine because now that single board computer is going to have to be made or imported in huge numbers. And there's an organization inside of Brazil called Antel. And Antel wants to see all of these devices and test them and certify them to make sure that they're not going to interfere with anything else. And that's when you have to pay the 60,000 US dollars to be able to get that certification. That's a problem if your unit isn't certified originally. And this is not just the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth, but it's also, do you have certification for consumer products and things like that? Is your GPS certified? What measurement of heat and vibration testing can your unit endure? Is it only consumer grade or is it at least industrial grade? And finally, have the royalties on all of the patents been paid by the manufacturer? Again, this doesn't affect you necessarily if what you're doing is just using it for your own use. But when you start to manufacture it, you better make sure that any royalties have been paid. Otherwise, you will have some government official knocking at your door. If you're going to go into very high production, you need to think about the business terms, the prices that you can get for volume discounts of the parts making up your system. And think about the criteria for acceptance of your unit coming out. Believe it or not, in the manufacturing of these boards, you typically can only have one failure in 1,000 units being manufactured. And they're manufacturing these units at the rate of 10,000 a day. So after they produce 10,000 systems, you can only have 10 that fail. You can imagine you know, any less than that or any greater failure rate than that, you're losing money because the cost it takes to send that system out the door and have it returned is more than the value of the system itself. So you want to have a very high non-failure rate of this board that you're purchasing for business terms. If you're buying this system for business terms, look at the history of the project or its credibility in keeping going. I have a whole trunk of single board computers that I have purchased that the company that made them, the companies that made them have gone out of business. I can't get support on them anymore. And so are these systems open systems? Do you have the circuit diagrams for them? Is there a project behind the porting of the code? Is the code open source? Because then you will have a chance of being able to fix this system and use it again. I have worked for a series of companies you will not know them because they are no longer in business. SGI, Digital Equipment Corporation. I have a half a million dollars of computer equipment in my basement. It would cost me $300 to have a haul the way to the, trunk, the junkyard. Beware. And when you're designing these boards or building these boards, take a look at the components. Are they at the beginning of the life, which means they will be produced a long time in the future, or at the end of life, which means that you'll never see them again? I've been on both sides. Take a look and see if you have good documentation. And look at the specifications, because often they are written by marketing people and maybe are not completely technically accurate. Make sure you can get copies of the circuit designs. Make sure you understand how to install the operating system. And make sure that the documentation has multiple translations. Is there a community around this board? Is there excitement about building it? The Raspberry Pi, if nothing else, has built a community of people interested in putting Linux, the Linux operating system onto the board and writing applications for it. Openness helps with longevity. 
The more open the system, the longer it will last. However, even longevity can be overrated because maybe upgradable is more important than just being long lifed. Now, a lot of times these days, processors are combined or combinable. So you see that the Arduino processor, for instance, is built into a little motherboard that fits into the uh, regular computer board. <laughs> Those are little bouncy penguins, aren't they? The other board does the more com complex processing, perhaps running the full Linux operating system. And the Arduino does the real-time work of gathering up the data and things like that. So if you have multiple different types of processing units on the same board, it can be very useful. So when you're building a product, you may want to say to build the control the circuits, the motor controls, the heater controls of things onto a motherboard and leave the other board available for the CPU and stuff. This allows you to build a prototype which can help you reduce costs and reduce risk of building the final project. Later on, you can combine all of these into one board to reduce the cost even further. Having this prototype helps you find funding. If you want to go out to a Kickstarter project or an Indiegogo project, if you first start with a working prototype, no matter whether it's built with a Raspberry Pi or other single board computer that's commercial or whatever, it's proven the concept. It goes a long way to making people feel sure that your Kickstarter project or your Indiegogo project will actually deliver on time. They, typically, Kickstarter projects and Indiegogo are very forgiving. However, there are still people that say, I'm not going to wait two years or five years for the thing which I've kicked in my money for. I'd like to have it in six months. So let's take a look at some of these little computers and ju judge them against each other. The Arduino was a great little computer. First came out as one of the first open designs, very open. It's really a microcontroller. It's not really a full-fledged CPU. Um, it has a small amount of memory, very small by today's standards. There's no real operating system on it. You basically write your program, you link the device drivers into the program, and you boot the program on the Arduino. There's a large variety of different shields and configurations for it that meet almost any task. Here's the Raspberry Pi Model B, the first one that came out. 35 US dollars in every place except Brazil. Uh, single core ARM processor. Oh, believe me, I'm aware of this. Single core ARM processor running at a blazing 700 megahertz. It had one half gigabyte of memory. I can't even sneeze in a half a gigabyte of memory. It had a 3D somewhat GPU. And it had hardware video to code that you could get if you paid the royalty for it, which was cheap. It was only a dollar, but you still had to pay for it. It had USB 2.0 at a blazing speed of 48 megabits a second. And to that, they hooked up their 10 100 megabit per second Ethernet. Wait a minute. It's 100 megabit per second Ethernet running off of the 448 megabit per second bus. There's something wrong with that. And then there's HDMI, which they had, and it was very good, with 23 GPIO pins and only 6 watts. Well, that was a little underpowered. So, uh-oh, I have the same slide there twice. We'll get back to that. Then it came along the Banana Pie, created by a different company. They had a dual-core arm running at 1,000 megahertz, right? So it's over twice as fast as the Raspberry Pi. It had a gigabyte of RAM, not good, but still better. It had a 3D GPU, pretty good. You didn't need a license from them to use the, the hardware. And they still had that gigabit per second with the USB 2.0, still doesn't make much sense. 
They had the same GPIO pins, but they had a SATA controller on there. So you could hook a disk drive up. That was very nice because you're not going to do real I.O. through your USB 2.0. It had an infrared receiver transmitter on it, and it only used three watts of power. Then the Raspberry Pi people came out with the Raspberry Pi Model 2, still 35 US dollars in every place but Brazil. And it had a quad-core processor on it, 64 bits, with still only one gigabyte of RAM. Now, 64-bit computer quad-core on one gigabyte of RAM is like shoving a string of spaghetti down a long tube. You're not going to get it to go very far, and even less when it's cooked, OK? It's just a mismatch of speed versus RAM. And to make it all worse, they still had USB 2.0. They had no real I.O. on it to work. So you have a super fast CPU, or a reasonably fast CPU, quad core, 64-bit, hard, hard on RAM, and no really good I.O. Along came the Banana Pro. And oh, I didn't have it. that's another duplicate site. I'm sorry about that. Then you have Adaptiva's Parallela board. This is 249 USD, so a lot more expensive, but look at what you get for it. You get a dual-core ARM9 processor running at a very high speed. You get a field programmable gate array built into it, along with some digital signal processing chips. Now, remember what I said before, different CPUs, different computing power for different problems. This one had them all. It also had an Epiphany 16-core processor on it, where each core of the processor had 32 kilobytes of RAM to work on its own program individually. Can we say Bitcoin mining? Can we say, you know, high-intensity routing for, you know, internet routing? Very good, only five watts of power. And there is a parallel in detail. Now we have LeMaker Guitar. LeMaker is a company I've been working with for two years to try and bring inexpensive computers to Brazil. Because the big problem that you have in bringing computers into Brazil happens at the border, where the customs people say, oh, you're bringing a computer in? Well, it's going to be 100% tax on the price of the computer and shipping. So your computer costs $35, and to ship to here costs $20. That's $55. We double that. That's $110. And now you bring it into a store who wants to make a profit. That's $150. Good luck in giving that to a high school student and telling them, experiment with it. You know, it's like handing them gunpowder or dynamite and saying, experiment with it. <laughs> so, it turns out if you manufacture the computers inside of Brazil, they don't tax you at all on the CPU or the memory or any other active component. They charge you 16% taxes on the resistors and the capacitors. And so, the whole price of the system comes down dramatically. And so you can develop a LeMaker computer, which is four core, 32 bit, has BGNN networking, has eight gigabytes of flash memory on it, and put it on a series of three different motherboards. One of them is specially set up for doing Internet of Things, with lots of Grove connectors. Another one is a general purpose board for hackers that has Raspberry Pi compatible uh, GPIO pins, USB 2 and USB 3. And it has a Rev D, it's a Rev -D motherboard, which allows you to basically make a Beowulf supercomputer on the size of something like this. With four COM boards, which is 16 cores and eight gigabytes of memory, and a gigabit per second networking switch, all built onto one board. 
Now this is the B plus board. This was actually manufactured at LSI Tech, which is a branch of the University of Sao Paulo. This is one of 100 boards that was made last month, and we are now about to go into high-speed production. In high-speed production, we will be able to produce over 10,000 a day. We hope to have those ready by campus party in Sao Paulo. This is the Maker, the maker guitar close up. On the left-hand side is the COM board that has a 204-pin board, just the same like a dim socket, which has the CPU, the memory, the flash, and all of your high-speed components on it. And on the, right, on the right side is the B Plus motherboard with USB 3, USB 2, uh, infrared receiver, audio, digital, analog, input, output, HDMI, and uh, 8-bit camera and a... I see you making that, the, that, that thing in the back, right? Okay. I'll get to that in just a moment. And now I'll tell you about one more board. This is called the Optical Dynamics Liquid Router. This is a board that is shipping today. This has the same type of mechanisms that we had on the parallel board with the same processor but it's also got a lot more of the FPGA style computers on it. This is a little bit more expensive and is for specialized things. There's many of these little board computers out there and you can look at all of them and see which one is the best one for your use. Now, the typical cost to develop the single board computer, when you design one of these things, it will typically cost you from two to three million US dollars to get the design working. That's a combination of getting the hardware working, getting the manufacturing working, and putting the operating system. Then you set up your surface mount technology line. That will cost you about a hundred to four hundred thousand dollars to produce your first ten thousand units. That's without the cost of materials. That's just to set up the line. So you can see that any one of these boards is a large amount of investment that a lot of companies in Brazil do not want to do because they are afraid that they will lose on the investment. And if there's one thing I have learned in my 47 years in the computer field is there are two ways that you get people to do something. Number one, you make it so viable that they will climb Mount Everest to do it. Number two, you make it so easy that they will say, what the fuck? <laughs> and we have done a combination with this project to create these computers. Because we are going to give away our engineering expertise to all of the small companies here in Brazil who have SMD lines. We will make it easy for them, less costly for them to get started. And we will do it with a proven market board that has all this work already done. So competition will keep the price of the computers down and the opportunity of having the computers in. But more importantly, it will bring to Brazil the opportunity to participate in the design and creation of these single board computers to meet Brazilian needs. You will have jobs in producing these systems. Moreover, why do I show you this? It's because I have these, this weird hobby. I build things like this. This is basically a supercomputer that fits inside of a briefcase made out of single board computers. I have built this, it works. I am in the process now of redesigning them to use these and other systems. And then I will publish the design for you. Why is this interesting? Because teachers can use these to teach high performance computing. Teachers can use this to teach high availability computing. How do you make your system so they never go down, so you never are without computing? They can be used to teach heterogeneous computing. How do you write applications that can use Linux, NBSD, 
and Apple and Microsoft to your customer's best advantage. It's very portable. It can be installed in minutes. It can work off of solar power, so you don't need very good electricity. And the cost of building the original prototype was 500 US dollars. I hope to get it down to 400 US dollars for building that. And it may also incorporate the Parallel board, as I showed you before, and some other interesting computers. But now I add the last part of this picture, Subutai. Subutai is a product of Optimal Mechanics Dynamics that I have started working for. I am the CEO. It is a open source, federated, peer-to-peer -peer cloud structure. What does this mean? You have internet that's brought to you by your telephone company or your cable company. It allows you to communicate from one system to the other. But if you want to use something known as the cloud, you have to go to Amazon or you have to go to Google, or you have to go to some other company who wants to hold your data and wants to manipulate you with it. We decided we didn't like this. We wanted to create a cloud that you would be in control of. And you could sell this extra CPU time on your board, the extra data time on your, the extra data on your disk, the extra RAM you have, you can sell that to other people who need it, and they can sell theirs to you. And you will have control about where your data goes. And you will have control about what you want to buy. You will have control. You will be able to make money with this. The software is free and open. And this is the last part of the puzzle that we have because I've been working for over 12 years to bring this to you. It's called the triple play. In baseball, a triple play means you have a person on each base and the batter hits a long run, a home run, a grand slam. This is the triple play because LSI Tech will be generating these little computers and others that we need to provide you with the computer power. Optimal Dynamics will be producing the cloud software which will allow you to have control over where your data is, and the software will be free of charge. The Linux Professional Institute is a certification organization, and they are the suppliers of these wonderful little penguins. Way out there. Way out there. You guys, you can do, just when I'm going to, another one. <laughs> And they will certify you so that they can tell, and your customers will be able to tell, that you know what you're doing. And Project Kawan will then allow you to start a company, your own business, something owned by you, not anybody else. Whether you are a student, whether you are a single mother, whether you are a person who is physically handicapped, you will be able to do this job, and you will get all of the money to go into your pocket, not into the pocket of a boss. This is capitalism at its finest, because you, the harder you work, the more money you will make. That is my promise to you. And so the time frame for this is we are starting a pilot of this in Ubatuba in October, this October. All of these parts will be coming together. We're bringing Super 2 engineers to Ubatuba to participate, to train Brazilians in how to do this work. We will have more pilots in Brazil starting in the January, February timeframe. Now, what happens in late January, early February? Oh, come on, that's at least worth a penguin. 
Campus Party Brazil starts. And so we'll be doing, hopefully we'll be doing training at Campus Party. Hopefully we will be selling these at cost uh, at Campus Party. And then the people that want to have participate in pilots will be able to do this throughout the rest of Latin, uh, Brazil in 2018 and through the rest of Latin America in 2020. So we will have world domination by 2025. You know, you guys laugh at that, but I showed this once to an accounting firm and they looked at me and they said, you know, this scales without bound. I said, I know it does. I designed it that way. Because there's only volume. Volume is the only thing that matters. So we will be looking for partners who are believers in this model. For all the people who have said to me, where is Linux on the desktop? I say, I don't care because it doesn't matter. The desktop is your phone, the desktop is your tablet, the desktop is a browser. It really doesn't make any difference. What does make a difference is that you will be in control of your software and your job. And I, told, I said I didn't have any time for questions, but apparently I do have a few minutes. So if people would like to ask a few questions, I will be able to have to answer. Oh, the sir at the back, the cost of this little computer. I've been told that the cost will be from 250 reais to 300 reais, maybe a lot less depending on our volume. Questions? Do we have any questions? Okay, uh, how many questions do you have time for? I don't know. How many questions do I have time for? Gente, quem quer perguntar, levanta a mão. Seven or five minutes. Okay. Okay. Some, need more water? I, no, but I may need somebody to help. Lucas. Sorry? I can do the first. Go ahead. Do you think that the Brazilian government is going to do something to support uh, this product and to make prices? lower? The Brazilian government has already done some stuff. I can't talk about it, but they have. They know about this project and they embrace it. Okay. Thank you. I will say this is not about politics. This is about economics. I don't care what your party is inside of Brazil. If you're against economics, you're sick. So this works no matter what the policies of the government are. This is all privately financed, no government funding. We'll, we'll take money from the government, no problem, but we don't depend on it. Thank you. So you can ask questions in Portuguese now, and I will have translation for me. You guys have to sit further down in the front. I'm an old man. I've had a heart attack. Sure. These these nice young ladies are gonna help yeah. me. Try and hit the back. No. Walk around up there. Can you let two for the position guy? Sure. Here, take some. Thank you. These are for the other people who help.
The peanut gallery. Alguém mais quer perguntar? Aqui pergunta, atrás. Pergunta, pergunta. Ok, questions. Okay, I can. Uh, I have a, a question to do. Uh, what, which kind of partners are you looking for here in Brazil? Here in Brazil. Well, we are looking for distributors who would be willing to sell the little single board computers. We are looking for people who are trainers and educators who would want to learn about Subarai and be able to help to train other people. When I say help to train, I mean you'd be paid for it. This is a service. We, are, we know, I'm into free software, but I'm not into free giving away my time for nothing, okay? And what people don't misunderstand about free software is it is the freedom that it gives you. The freedom to teach what you want, the freedom to use the software the way you want. So I'm all for making money. And that's why when I said I'm pragmatic and I have win, 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 Everybody will be making money with this. The only people that will not be making money is over and next. The only people that will not be making money are the people who simply want to take it from you. Next question. Okay. Uh, all right, yeah. Uh, so hi, my name is Matthew. Um, I want to know why not bring the Raspberry Pi for, uh, from here, from Brazil? I tried for two years. I know three people on the Raspberry Pi Foundation Board of Directors. I invited them to come here. They came to Sao Paulo to this campus party. They saw the enthusiasm. Now, I love the people. I think they did a great job. But you know, the Raspberry Pi was created at the University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom. Kingdom. Yes. And at first, they were manufactured in Taiwan in a small thing because they thought they'd only need 1,000 of them. But then they needed 10,000, then 100,000. And then they developed another line contributed by Sony in Wales. Now, what part of the world is Wales? It's in the United Kingdom. So, would you, you know, go through all the trouble of working with the Brazilian government to bring a manufacturing line to Brazil to give work to Brazilians when you're taking away work from Sony in Wales, which is part of the UK? Oh, got it. Well, the last, the last <laughs> penguin. No, no. I want somebody who's going to ask a good question. I'm not just going to give this one away. One more question. Uh, here, 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 here. Uh, you mentioned in a previous slide that you uh, producing a. Who am I talking to? Wave your hand. Yeah. Oh, okay. You mentioned a distributed cloud. Yes. That you will be available to everybody. So yes. my question is, what will be the support for that? It will run on PCs, Windows Phone, Android, iPhone, web. What will be the, the environment that I can run it? It runs in a variety of different environments. So you can either dedicate an entire computer over to it, or you can run it inside of a virtual machine on your own computer. It doesn't have to take over your whole environment, okay? And you can actually go to the site today. You can get the, uh, the previous version, which is running today and shipping. This is actually version number five, or, or that was version number four. We're going to be reducing, reducing, I'm sorry, we're going to be giving out version five any day now. So my recommendation is wait until version five releases, and then pull that down and start using it on your computer system. Okay? And you get a penguin, but um, unfortunately, I'm not going to run all the way up there. Would you take this up to him, please? Of course. Thank you. Okay. Or well, you're welcome to ask a question. I'm run out of, I've run out of penguins.
Oi. This is what I like about Brazilians. Hello. They help each other. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Guilherme. Boa tarde, meu Doug. É, quando a gente fala de desses computadores, a gente pensa logicamente no, nos computadores pessoais, nos computadores pessoais. Então, esses, esse, esse seu computador também pode um dia estar integrado à televisão ou uma impressora ou automação como um todo residencial ou comercial? The answer is yes. Okay, we are running. Uh, I am considering a number of applications that will run on this whole system that will be available by Campus Party in Sao Paulo. One application is aimed specifically towards small business, of being able to manage your business better. The application exists today. It is called Udu. And it will, we will get this running on this little computer system we will be selling. So if you're part of Project Kawan, you'll be able to sell this to your customers and earn money in supporting this in small business to your customers. The other main application is called Kodi. And basically, it's an application for creating a home media center. But we're also going to have it be your first terminal connected to your internet supplier. And this will allow you to store your music, store your videos, access the internet, even home security and home automation. This software already exists. We will have it ready by Campus Party on top of Subutai. So with Subutai, if you need extra power to run some of these applications, you'll be able to reach across the internet and purchase them for a very, very, very small amount of money. Okay. <laughs> uh, I wanted to know what drives you besides money. I am 67 years old. I had my 67th birthday on August the 7th as I was flying here to Salvador. I've had over the last 10 years, people come up to me and say, thank you, Mad Dog, because I listened to you 10 years ago and now I am this chief technical officer of my company. Thank you, Mad Dog. I listened to you 10 years ago, and now I own a company that employs 60 people. Thank you, Mad Dog, because I listened to you when you advised IBM to do open source, and they generated $2 billion worth of revenue. I've made my living because of things that other people gave me, and now this is my way to give back. Don't worry, I'll make money off of these projects, but it won't be money that will come from you. It'll be money that comes from other ways. And I've learned those in my 47 years of being in the computer industry. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming.